Hello, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crossroads, where faith and culture meet. I'm your host, Rita Peters, and I'm going solo once again today with the hosting duties because my co-host, Mark Meckler, is very busy this week. But don't worry, because we have our special guest, Rosalind Weisenberger, back today for a second week as we embark upon the fifth chapter of our series on servant leadership. Rosalind, you are a teacher and a mentor in this whole area, so we're so honored to have you. Welcome back to the program. You know what? Thank you, Rita. I had so much fun last week, and I'm looking forward to what we're going to uncover today. Well, as I mentioned, we are already up to chapter five, and the book, again, in case you're just joining us, is Servant Leadership by David Kuhnert. That's K-U-H-N-E-R-T. And we're talking about servant leadership on the Crossroads program because it is practical training that will help us maximize our impact, not only on our families and our colleagues in the workplace, but also on the culture around us. You know, we spend lots of programs talking about all of these different issues in the culture around us and and the impact that we would like to have on that culture as people of faith. But through this series on servant leadership, we are really seeking to give you the tools that you need to have influence on people and to really maximize your impact on those around you. Now, I'm going to ask Rosalind this morning to help me take a few minutes just to summarize what we've learned so far in the book, because we're halfway through now. So I am going to read off each of the chapter titles that we've already done. And Rosalind, I'm going to ask you (laughs) to summarize each one in a sentence or two. And I think that's a really tall order, Um, but this is an environment of grace. So (laughs) don't be nervous about this. So chapter one, the structure of leadership and the framework for life. How would you summarize that? Okay, and really quick, I just want to to remind everybody, it's the first edition of David Kuhnert's book because he's written a second edition. So it's Servant Leadership, the first edition. And yes, it is a challenge to do this in one or two sentences because I like words. So I'm going (laughs) to give it a go. So chapter one, the structure of leadership and the framework for life. A servant leader helps influence people as they move from here, which is our current reality on the path which are the steps and milestone goals on the way to a clearly communicated there, which is the destination. And really quickly though, but David Kuhnert also talks about a transcendent there. That is our guiding star, a life direction we are continually reaching towards that we'll never fully attain and it keeps us focused. So that was three sentences, not two, but not too bad. That's okay. That one is so important, Rosalind, that I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to add one more thing to it. I wonder if you would be willing to share with our audience your transcendent there. Absolutely. So my transcendent there is to grow in trusting and loving God and loving others lavishly. So everything in my life falls under that. And if I make a decision and it's outside of that, um, it helps me to go, oh, bad decision. Let's change the path. Let's change the steps I'm doing and go in a different direction. Wow. I love the way you phrased your transcendent there or transcendent goal. And I think it's really helpful for people to have that as, you know, to to sort of put flesh on the bones of what we're talking about here. Okay. So chapter two of the book is goal setting and the two theirs. And again, if you're just joining us for the first time, a there is a goal. So tell us about goal setting and the two theirs, Rosalind. Absolutely. So on the path, we'll have many goals and steps to help us move towards our there. And we want them to be SMART, which is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, results-oriented, and time-bound. And we also want them and all of our decisions to be what he's calling the two there's, I call them focus, 
We want them to be we focused and not me focused. That's a big one. <laughs> we, tend to, we tend to be me focused, so it really takes some um, concentration and intentionality to shift to be we focused instead of me focused. OK, chapter three is power and influence and leadership styles. How would you summarize what we learned about that, Rosalind? OK, so this chapter helps us explore different forms of influence and leadership, emphasizing that if we truly want to inspire others, we need to know our values, stewarding our character in the many areas of our lives, which he calls pillars. And this flips the, the model of um, leadership upside down from the physical model, which is being top down to a mental model, which is serving upward. OK, that's that's good. There's a lot in there. You are really <laughs> you're really doing a good job with your assignment, Rosalind. OK, <laughs> chapter four is really an interesting one, and that's the one we covered just last week with your help. Chapter four is freedom versus control. What is the takeaway lesson there? Uh, so I think the takeaway is that the freedom V is a way to clearly communicate structure, boundaries, expectations, and consequences, creating clear space to develop self-governance, um, which is really taking responsibility for our choices. And then recognizing there are always three things we can control, who I trust, my actions, and my attitudes. And we had a great conversation last week about how we tend to think that we have control over so many things that we really have no control at all over. And so it's really beneficial and useful when we can just focus in on the, those three things that we actually do have control over and let our energy be directed there. Um, we save ourselves a lot of heartache and a lot of frustration. Absolutely. And we're okay. able to encourage other people because when we're controlling them, we're not, we're not, excuse me, developing or encouraging them. But when we recognize what we can control and we can influence, it's life changing. Yeah. And, you know, there's one one point from from chapter five that I don't think we got a chance to talk about last week, but I maybe we can just spend a few minutes. We kind of ran out of time last week because there was so much in that last chapter. Um, but David Kuhnert, the author, talks about how when we try to control others, it ends up that they are actually controlling us. Yes. And I wonder, can you give us an example or explain how that works just briefly? You know what? I can give an example. I think of when my son was in junior high and he had a project or an assignment and we worked on things a lot together um, and we would work on it and it was finished and then he'd go to school and he left it at home. Oh. And I, I felt all of the things that he should be feeling. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's going to get a bad grade. He worked really hard. Maybe I should go take it to school for him. And my husband go, Rosalind, this is Caleb's project. If he thinks that if it's important to him, he'll take it in. So I had taken all of the control on myself and it had, I was trying to control the situation and it was really controlling me. And I was taking on burdens that weren't mine to be taken on. And I wasn't allowing my son to grow in self-governance. And I think that's what happens when we control, we start taking all the responsibility and the burden on ourselves, And we're not allowing the other person to become self-governed. Yeah. That's a great example because I think that is something that tends to happen to us moms a lot when we are raising yeah. our children. We love them so much. We want everything to go well, but um, sometimes we can shift into that control mode, which is not good or helpful for anyone. No. <clears throat> okay. Well, today we are on chapter five, as I said which introduces a new concept. I had never heard of this before reading this book, so I'm guessing it will probably be new to our listeners as well. But the concept is called the Project Mood Curve. 
So Rosalind, let's dive right into this. And why don't you just explain for us what the project mood curve is? Okay, so the project mood curve helps describe our journey on the path between here and there. So whether you're looking at an organization, relationships, projects, um, nothing in life is immune from the curve, which might sound once we get into it and we talk about a pit, it might sound daunting, but it's actually helpful, and encouraging because we know what to expect. So there, there are five phases or stages of the mood curve. Um, the first one is called forming, and this is the beginning. Everything is new and exciting. Hope of success is high, and we're able to envision so many possibilities. I think the word that would sum it up really um, well is that it is the optimistic phase. Um, and then the second phase is the storming phase. And this is where you recognize, oh my goodness, there is such a huge learning curve. You're trying to figure out where do I fit in? What is my role? Um, you, you're beginning to recognize the gap between what your expectations were and the reality <clears throat> is so much bigger than you thought it would be. And it's going to be hard. And this is what um, David, we call the pit of despair. So it's, it's help, and a lot of people go, why are you calling it the pit of despair? It's because that's what we feel like. We feel like we're like stuck in this dark uh, cave and there's nowhere to go, but that's not really true. There, there are two voices. Um, will I persevere or will I quit? And it's important to know that if we quit, we're actually just gonna enter into another mood curve. The third is norming. And this is when we've persevered. We've made it through the pit of despair. We begin to get in a rhythm. We're starting to grasp our role. Um, we're beginning to understand the culture and individuals are starting to take ownership and responsibility. Trust is building and growing. Um, and what once seemed unknown and unfamiliar is becoming familiar and is becoming part of, it's kind of like learning to tie your shoes at first like oh my goodness there's no way we can do that and then you're starting to get get how to do it um, the next one is the performing phase we work together serving in ways we never imagined and this is because we've taken time to act learn and adjust um, through each of the phases we're growing in self-governance uh, we're beginning to see innovation commitment and excitement and this is where we're thriving and productive we're tying our shoes, we can do it with our eyes closed now. It's second nature. But we need to remember we can't stay in the performing phase. Um, when we take another step on the path, our here changes and we enter into another mood curve. And then the fifth phase, and we don't always get to do the adjourning phase because some projects you finish and then everybody disperses. But when we get an opportunity to do the adjourning phase, it's where we meet, it's after we've met our goal and we look back to learn lessons for the next project. So say that last phase again, the adjourning phase? Yes, the adjourning phase is where we get to gather together and look back and learn the lessons from the project for the next project. So we ask ourselves questions, you know, what went well? What can change? What do we just not want to ever do again? So mm. we, this is the act, learn, and adjust for the next phase that we're in. Okay, so to recap, the, the five phases of the project mood curve are forming, storming, norming, performing, and adjourning. I we love that they all like rhyme. Dr. Seuss, yes. <laughs> yes, they all rhyme, and then there's the last one that doesn't rhyme. That's I wanted to make sure I was hearing it. Correctly. Um, okay, so David Cooner, the author, Rosalind, says that everything in life goes along this path. Have you found that to be true? You know what? I have found it to be absolutely true, and we can't escape it. And sometimes we want to escape. We don't want to face the pit because the pit is uncomfortable. But I don't know about you, most of my um, greatest life lessons have been learned um, in the pit and moving through the pit. Mm. So it's something that we all need to encounter. And 
earlier I had said that recognizing the curve is actually encouraging and it's because I know I'm going to face it so I can prepare. So beforehand, I can have this conscious decision in my head. I know the three things I can control because when we're in the pit, we feel like we have no control. There's nothing I can do. I don't know what to do, but I can focus on who I trust, which helps dictate my actions and my attitudes. And it's also encouraging to know I'm not alone in the pit, that this is universal. Everybody in the entire world spends time in the pit. The difference is the length of time we spend and the depth of the pit, but we all experience it and that there's ways out. Mm. That's so good. So the pit or the pit of despair is this point that we get to after we've gone through the forming and then we're we're in the storming and we realize how hard it actually is, right? And so we get into this pit of despair. You know, it's funny, Roslyn, on this past weekend, I was on a long drive by myself. So I I was listening to an audio recording of the Pilgrim's Progress, which I love. And so they, Pilgrim, Christian didn't go through um, a pit of despair, but they called it the swamp of despair. And that's really what we're talking about here, right? And what I found so interesting about it was he and his friend, I can't remember the friend's name, but they both went into the swamp of despair and the friend gave up and decided the the easiest thing for him to do was to get back out on the side of the swamp of despair that was closest to his home that he had come from. So he went, he still had to go through it, but he went back and got out and went back to where he came from. While Christian persevered through that swamp of despair and made it to the other and got out of it on the other side, closer to his goal. And so, Rosalind, I wonder, like, what what words of advice can you give us? You mentioned focusing on the three things that we can control, but how can we make sure that we don't lose our courage and lose sight of our transcendent there and turn back? How do we make sure we keep moving forward and persevere? That is a good question. So, so for me, um, what my, my transcendent there is, is my life goal and it's what I base my entire life on. And so I recognize when, when my attitude is out of whack and my actions, it's because I'm not trusting God. And there's Mm. something that, that needs to be redone this morning. I, I love praying for people. And so we could even say that's a forming thing. I enjoy praying for people. I believe it's an honor and a privilege that I have. But there are times when I'm praying for people, and this happened this morning, um, God asked me to do something that's really hard. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's difficult. That mm-hmm. might affect the relationship I have with the person. Um, and then that was happening this morning. And so I was wrestling through all of this going, but God, you know, but God, but what if, um, and after all of my wrestling and the things that I was coming to, it really boiled down to, but Rosalind, are you going to trust and obey me? Mm. And for me, that, that was the turning point. That's the, okay, remember what is really important. And then it helped me to move to what we could call the, the norming phase is, yeah. hey, God, then what does this look like? Um, mm. How, how can I share this with her in a way that that is humble and respectful and kind? Because that's truly what I want to do. I don't want to be self-righteous and, and go and say, this is what you need to do or, or what have you. Um, and then the performing part of it is taking that step of trust. So for me, it really is going back to God's word. What does God say? And there are times, too, it's inviting other people into into the discussion because sometimes it's hard sometimes i can't get out of the pit on my own and there are times i'll just go steve here's what's going on can you speak truth 
because I can't mm. see what's going on. I'm just totally stuck. And can you come and speak truth um, into, into my life? And that's why it's so important to have people that are trustworthy, that we trust to join us as we're walking, you know, in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for you are with me. Um, so for me, that's it. So it's, it's God is inviting other people to speak truth because sometimes I can't do it on my own. I love that. And I would echo that too, Rosalind. I know so many times I find myself in that place and I know I'm in the pit, but I, I just, I can't pull myself out. And so mm -hmm. sometimes it does take turning to someone I trust who will speak truth to me, not just what I want to hear, not just, oh, you're right. It's too hard. Yes, that you shouldn't be expected to do whatever it is, but I need someone to speak truth to me and that, that helps me get through. So thank you for sharing that. Now, how does understanding the project mood curve help us to be effective and impactful leaders in, in our culture, in our society, or even in our homes, whatever, whatever kind of example you want to use. How does knowing this information help us? You know, I, it, it helps me, like I said, because it helps me prepare, but it also helps us prepare our teams, our family members um, for the pit. If we understand the different, the different steps. And like I mentioned before, it also helps to, to, to shorten the amount of time that we spend in the pit. When we remember that it is not a collapsed building, it is not, we're not caved in, but it's a tunnel. And at the end, there's an exit. Um, mm -hmm. So it helps us to recognize where our team or individual team members may be on the curve because not everybody's on the same place at the same time. And knowing where they are gives us insight into what they, they might need from us as a leader. Do they need me to be more participative? Do they need me to be more directive? Um, really quick, if, if we have time, I just yeah. want to share maybe some of the things that we could do in the different stages. Now, yeah. this is not an exhaustible list. So like in the forming stage, as a leader, we can set the expectations. That's the freedom V. Mm -hmm. um, we begin creating the culture, the language, start talking about act, learn, and adjust. We start talking about um, responsibility and not blame. We explain the mood curve. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? We are all really excited right now, but I need to let you know this is what's going to happen next, but this isn't the end. We can move out of it. Mm. And we always focus on the there, our mission. Mm. Um, that that is huge in all of the different phases we want to focus on are there and the yeah. storming phase i'm sorry no go ahead this is great in the storming phase uh we can clearly communicate are there once again remind our team why we are doing what we're doing and why what we do matters this is huge because when you're in the pit you feel like nothing i do it doesn't matter <laughs> you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And as a leader, we can help people remember, no, what you're doing really matters. Um, it's also important to just acknowledge where we are, to acknowledge the fact that we're in the pit of despair and walk with our team through it. Mm. Not just talk them through it, but walk with them through it. Mm. In the, the norming phase, we can celebrate making it through the pit and we should celebrate that <laughs> uh, because it's hard. It's work and it takes effort to do that. Show appreciation and resolve conflict that arose mm. because conflict's going to arise in the pit. So now we can go ahead and we can deal with it. And then in the performing phase, we affirm the culture. We continue investing in each person because remember, it's about relationships. It's about valuing and developing people. We expand leadership. Sometimes in the pit, uh, leaders come forward. We, we see strengths that we didn't know in people. Maybe they get moved in different positions or different places on the bus. And we continue developing and creating goals to there. Mm. And then the adjourning, I kind of mentioned it before. We gather everybody together to review. And we ask what went well, what can we change, and what do we want to keep? Mm. 
That is so helpful. And I particularly love what you said about helping as leaders, helping those around us to be aware of this project mood curve, because it, it really is useful just to be expecting it so that it's not taking you by surprise. You don't think, oh, you know, we're the only ones going through this. We're the only ones experiencing this. And I can say from experience, um, our most of our listeners know that I work for the Convention of States Action, and I have been involved with this since the very beginning, since the founding of the organization. And we started out and it was so exciting and, you know, we could do it. We knew we had a plan. We knew how we were going to do it. And we definitely went through the pit and <laughs> of, oh, this is harder than we thought it was going to be. This isn't working the way we thought it would be. And so just knowing that that is normal, that is part of the process is really helpful to keep um, to keep us from being discouraged. Now, one thing I want to ask you about, David Cooner, the author, says that Christians tend to have more willpower to get through, you know, the pit, for example, than non-Christians. Is that true? And if so, why? So I have found it to be true. Um, Our commitment to get there leads to change, forming new habits, creating a new normal which takes time, energy, and effort, and is hard. And to be honest, I don't like change. Um, so, you know, I can use my willpower, but my willpower power is limited. Um, I had mentioned last time that I have MS, and there are things that no matter how much willpower I use, it won't happen. Mm-hmm. And more often than not, my willpower quits more than it perseveres. Um, And so what I have learned is that God, whose steadfast love is faithful and Mm. whose power and strength is limited, is trustworthy. And he's Mm. led me to things I never thought possible because through his power and his strength, I can do the impossible because it's him doing that. Um, If you had asked me years ago, even probably just five years ago, would I be today sitting here with Rita Talking about servant leadership, I would have said, absolutely not. I don't have the energy. I I don't have the strength to do that. And yet God in doing his, the impossible things he can do, here I am today. So Mm -hmm. my willpower would have said, no way. I would have never had been in a position to do this. And God said, yes, Rosalind, trust me. Mm -hmm. Lean on and just see what I can do. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not so much that we in and of ourselves have all this extra willpower. It's more that the one we trust in has infinite power that we can plug into and can get us going and get us through things we didn't think we could get through. Is that it? Exactly. Great summary. Yes. (laughs) All right. Well, we are almost out of time already, but before before I close, Rosalind, is there, like, do you have final thoughts? What do you hope that um, people would take away from the program today? You know what? Not to fear the pit of despair. Mm. It's, it's a tunnel, like I said before, it's not a caved in or collapsed building, and it's not the end of the story. It's just a hard chapter. Um, Mm. I found that my greatest lessons have been forged in some of the most difficult pits. Um, Remember your transcendent there. Um, For me, turn to God, ask him to give you insight and to help you see through his eyes because his perspective changes everything. Our circumstances don't change, but he allows us to see through his eyes and that changes everything. Mm. Rosalind, thank you so much. It has been a joy going through chapter five with you, and I am looking forward to having you back again when we get to chapter six. I can't wait to see what we're going to do. All right. Well, I want to thank our generous sponsors at Blue Ridge Chimney Services, Blessings Christian Bookstore, Sunshine Ministries with Christian Radio, Wishing Well Florists and Travel Services, and our good friends at New Beginnings Church and Garber's Church of the Brethren in Harrisonburg. 
thank you all for listening and also for your encouragement and your continued financial support. If you'd like to make a donation to help keep Crossroads on the air, you can do so by check to Crossroads at P.O. Box 881, Harrisonburg, Virginia, 22803. And if you'd like to send a personal note to our Crossroads team, you can do so to the same address, Crossroads, P.O. Box 881, Harrisonburg, 22803. We would love to hear from you. And finally, if you'd like to listen to this program again or share it with your friends, go to valleyfamilyforum.org and click on the link to Crossroads on the homepage. I'm Rita Peters, inviting you to join us again next week for our next chapter of Servant Leadership and our next edition of Crossroads, where faith and culture meet.